Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at Messiah Lutheran Church. Thank you for all those that are gathered with us here on campus on this beautiful spring day. I can just tell by looking out here just the colors and clo the, the clothing choices. It is officially spring. It is upon us. That's wonderful. And we also want to take some time to greet those that are joining with us online. Thank you for worshiping here at Messiah Lutheran Church on this Sunday in the season of Easter. Good morning, and yes, a warm welcome to you on this beautiful day. We are so blessed. Let us prepare our hearts for worship with my opening song in this very room. Thank you.
The Lord says to us this morning, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for he is God and there is no other. Only in the Lord it shall be said of him, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come, all shall come and be humbled, all who are incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of the church shall be justified and shall glory. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship here at Messiah Lutheran Church. Take a moment to greet those around you. Morning. <laughs> Greetings. Good morning and welcome. Just a couple of updates on the calendar. We have a blood drive coming up next Sunday. If you haven't given blood recently, we definitely encourage you to be a part of that. Let us know so we can make sure we have enough for that uh, bus that comes and does that for us. And you have an insert about our wonderful movie night coming up this weekend. And it says Friday, but it's actually Saturday. So that's just our viral way of helping you remember that it's Saturday that we're going to watch. Uh, we have a movie night, uh, popcorn, fun with friends from church. There will be movies for the little kids, uh, for mostly uh, older kids, junior high and uh, upper elementary. We're going to watch The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, a wonderful Easter story, and then a great conversation that you can have with your family. And then we'll have a movie for the older, uh, for the adults as well. A lot of other great things going on there. Please look through the bolts and be a part of what God's doing here. At this time... We are blessed by our shining, bright, springful, joyful sanctuary choir.
ladies and gentlemen, our deep and thoughtful, reflective sanctuary choir. Maybe spring and joyful. It was uh, maybe on the. Uh, it was a different intro. I should have given. I need to get you a book of adjectives. Yeah, superlatives. Yeah. Uh, let's join in our worship as as we sing our our hymns of praise.
Just ask God to fill you, use you, mold you, prepare you for his work. Uh, you've asked God to take something out of your jar and put something else in its place, his Holy Spirit. So let's, let's use confession and allow God to do that same thing in us, to let go of whatever we're holding on to and hear his healing words of forgiveness, presence. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God who is faithful and just, he forgives and he cleanses from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment to pray and reflect. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day and every day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me that I may rest in peace and live each day for you. By the mercy of God, we are united with Jesus Christ, and in Him, you are forgiven. Rest now in that peace, serving Him every morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord, you, you have blessed us in so many ways. Our family, our studies, the, the rest and relaxation even if it means taking care of the yard on a beautiful spring weekend. Lord, you are the provider and sustainer of all things. May all that you've entrusted to us, our resources, our time and energy, our family, our care of spouse, our daily work, our studies as students, may it all, even the rest and relaxation, may it be for you and your story, your glory, your eternal story, that we might be that healing presence for each other. We offer that, Lord, to you. Thank you for giving and inspiring us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now gather the morning's offering and receive the gift of music.
Please stand for the, oh wait, you're standing, sorry. Continue standing for the reading of God's word. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson today is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you uh, delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. In his name, by faith in his name alone, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Our epistle lesson today is from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be uh, called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall, be, we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies him, as he is pure. Our gospel letter is uh, lesson is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that, is, that it is I myself? Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when, and, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you got anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed from power from on high. This ends the reading. Thank you, Jeff. You may be seated. Go Plainfield Central. We've been having a little rivalry. Our sons are both playing on the freshman team, his for South and mine for Central. It's been fun to watch. Then both beat Plainfield North this last week. Are there any Plainfield North families here? Sorry. All right. Uh, but that's not the message today. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 41 to 45. The disciples 
their first encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Two of them have just come back from Emmaus and they're talking about this amazing story of Jesus eating bread and being, being seen and recognized in the breaking of bread just as he broke his body for their sins, our sins. In this moment, suddenly Jesus appears and it says that they disbelieved for joy and marveled. How it is that this man, who they'd walked with and talked with, they saw crucified, killed, buried, dead, was standing in front of them, flesh and blood. Jesus even takes some fish and eats it. And then he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. This is Luke's carefully inspired remembering of his experience with the resurrected Jesus. Luke wants you to experience what he experienced. He is certain about God and what he has said to the world because of this moment. And he wants you to be certain as well. And I wonder, did he know that God's living word would do that for you and I even now 2,000 years later? that we might experience Jesus as he did, to have our minds opened. I really want to zero in on the open-minded aspect of faith. When Jesus produced faith in them, he did so by opening their minds. When, When Jesus produces faith in us, where it is not, we put our faith in different things, takes that away and opens us. He doesn't isolate us. He doesn't cookie cutter us. He opens us into something more than than we could imagine. I really want to zero in on the open mindedness of faith, but I don't want you to miss out on how they experienced it. They disbelieved (laughs) for joy in the middle of this experience and marveled at Jesus' real earthly flesh, fleshy presence. A kind of, what does this mean? Type of joyful, hopeful disbelief. They were debating in their minds, could this be true? How can this be? And yet there's no arguing against it. It's right there in front of them. Flesh and blood, loving and forgiving, and they cannot argue with it, no matter how much they debate it in their mind. Philosophy tells us that the only absolute certainty that we can really have comes through faith, not knowledge. We're forced to believe something to be true by an experience that comes at us outside of ourselves. That's what makes us certain about something. That type of certainty on a psychological level is truer than anything someone tells us to be true, any trivia or knowledge or fact. If someone says, well, this is what is true, it isn't certain to us. It doesn't feel real to us until we've actually experienced that same truth, that same reality. In other words, you really have to in order to be certain about something, experience it. It's no wonder that a lost and distracted world is looking for real life experiences, especially younger generations, right? It's all about the experience and the photo op. No wonder that the younger generations are looking for real world experiences like a solar eclipse, something they can share with others. They're craving certainty. We are all craving certainty, a certainty promised by the scientific evaluation of facts or the scholastic pursuit of knowledge, but never truly given. We can read something is true on the news all we want, but until we actually experience it, then we become Certain about it. Knowledge does not give certainty. The experience that leads to faith creates certainty. And of course, you can do a science experiment and experience it. That's a way of doing it. But often, 
what we truly believe is something that happens to us that we weren't prepared for. We didn't set up. We didn't create an experiment to prove to ourselves whether something was true or not. Truth reveals itself to us. What we are most certain about, what guides our life, what we have faith in, is not something we chose, but something that chose us. It was Luke and the other disciples and 500 other witnesses throughout Jerusalem of this. They witnessed a living, talking, breathing man who had just been publicly humiliated and killed. It was a shared experience. They were certain about it. This guy was resurrected from the dead. That's why it's the most historically accurate recorded event in history. Most, most things written about it. Most times that what was written about it was reaffirmed to be true. Because there's, they experienced it. They were certain about it. They didn't want to experience it. This wasn't something they were looking forward to. They didn't know what he would have to say to them once they saw him. But it was a shared experience of certainty nonetheless that they could not help but share with others. You'll never believe what happened to me. And let's be clear what this resurrected Jesus had to say to the world then and now. Why did he come back from the dead? Certainly he had something to say. What is it that he had to say to his disciples, to you and I, to the world? Peace. Peace be with you. Be at peace with yourself. Be at peace with each other. And most certainly, whatever burden, whatever weight you've placed upon your shoulders that you think I need, it's gone. Be at peace with your maker and creator. You're everything I intended you to be. And I am the power at work Sustaining you in that which I have designed, promised to the world through you. Peace be with you. The rumors of grace and truth and the redemption of all things, what all the prophets and the Psalms had pointed to, is actually true. Everything's going to be okay. Because God's in control, not us. God came to the earth and very clearly and publicly and with great cost to himself proved to us that that power behind all things, that power outside of ourselves, that intangible spiritual force that unites all things, it's there for you. God is for you. God wants you to have peace. God is mercy and salvation, just as he promised to be throughout the signs and the psalms and the prophets of old. And that most certainly is good news. That is a message worth repeating and sharing with a lost and distracted world. That there's peace to be found in the message of the scriptures, in the message of the cross, in the message, in the what they'll hear on any given Sunday morning. What signs have you seen in, in your life? What, what times in your life have you seen a sign and you thought, that means something? It was just a coincidence, just a, an image or an experience that said to you, this is important. I remember in all three of my calls in Iowa and Minnesota and here in Illinois, Sometime in the first week of my ministry, probably I think it was the first Sunday I preached each of those churches, I saw a hawk or an eagle soaring high above. And I don't know what that means, but I took it as a sign that I was where I was supposed to be. What are the signs that God... What are the signs that you've seen in your life that have spoken to you? Luke chapter 24, verses 45, Jesus speaks to them. He opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus opens their minds. What does it mean to you 
to be open-minded. Are you open to the many and varied ways that the great spiritual river that buffets your life might be speaking to you? Of all the messages and stories, promises and signs from beyond, of all the ways the great cosmic other is speaking to you, what is that clear and central message that guides your life in this season? Who's talking to you? And what's the cosmic they saying? Since the beginning of time, we've looked at the stars and asked whether they're saying something to us. More than just the, you know, pointing in a direction like the wise men, but maybe guiding our life, actually giving us instructions on how to live our lives, something to believe in. Do they have a promise for you that can guide your life? The stars? There is a $12.8 billion astrology business market growing at a 5.7% compounded annual rate. I looked it up. It's big business, astrology. There is most certainly a market that has tapped into the very real belief that people have that the stars are speaking to them. You need look no further than the bookshelves and end caps of Barnes and Noble to see that this trend is more alive than ever, much more, a little better, doing a little better, that market, than the grocery store, checkout, dime store horoscopes that I grew up with. With the recent solar eclipse, ABC News interviewed an astrologist, makes sense. And through her expertise, she interpreted the stars for us. This is what she had to say. The stars guide us, <laughs> right? They are like a cosmic GPS. Well, she didn't say this, but not just pointing you in the right direction, but the stars can tell you when to turn and where, right? That's the claim that she's making. The ancient art of astrology makes. If you're one of the fire signs, Aries, Leo, Sagittarius, I mean, some of you may not even know what your sign is. Well, if that's the case, if you're one of those, this eclipse is asking you to rethink all of your daily routines, the structure of how you work, live, and in integrate those things into your life. What do you need? What do you need to be your fiercest self? You, after all, are the fire sign. Or if you're the air sign, that's Libra. I'm not going to do them all, but I'm going to do this one because it's Libra, Aquarius, and Gemini. I'm a Gemini. I'm a twin. My brother and I are twins, born under the sign of a twin. <laughs> Speak, prophet. If that's the case, this clips is about your relationships. What role are you playing in your relationships? Do they feel balanced? Do they feel like equal and harmonious? If not, what do you need to say? This is, I mean, horoscopes, they're not just pointing you in a direction. They're offering you guidance and, and probably helpful, positive, if you read it the right way. And then the overall message for everyone Eclipses by nature and astrology. Notice where the ethos is, where the promise is coming from. Nature promises, astrology promises that this eclipse is giving you a time of unexpected change. This eclipse will show you where in your life you've been holding on to something that is past its prime. To force, trying to force something to go in a direction that it's not supposed to. Now, as my habit, when I write my sermon, usually I, before I do the research and write it, I listen to the week before just to be mindful of what I've just spoken about. And I was shocked, <laughs> right, to see the parallels between the Easter message and this astrologist's interpretation of what eclipses stand for. And I was even more shocked to see the parallels between Last week's message of letting go, how God forces us to let go of 
those things that we've tied our fist around, like my daughter tying her fist into her hair as a young baby. And it shouldn't be shocked, right? That great cosmic power that we Christians call God is not limited to purely Christian means of grace to communicate to what is created, right? God, God chooses to speak in whatever way is available to whoever he can, however he can. But is this something I want to put my faith in? <laughs> There's certainly a life-shaping and guiding influence to reading a prophecy, whether you believe in it or not. You just read those words and, and ask the questions that they're asking you to ask, and it's going to shape your life. You can't help but start wondering, well, what are my relationships like? Am I my fiercest self? What does that even mean? But is this really the way? There certainly is a life-shaping influence in reading a prophecy based on the stars, but is this really the way in which creation, the cosmic, has chosen or is destined to speak to us? What if there is a clearer message, a promise hoped for by generations and generations, not from nature or astrology, but from a people who recorded the ways in which God was speaking to them through astrological signs, through prophets, through poetry, and through music. What if God has been saying something to us through a chosen people, a chosen story, the whole time? Luke chapter 24, verses 45, Jesus opened their minds to understand that old story what the prophets and the psalms and the scriptures had been pointing to all along. Jesus opens their minds. What does it mean to have an open mind? Are you open to the many and varied ways that this great spiritual river buffets your life and might be speaking to you? Are you open-minded? Open-minded enough to believe that 2,000 years ago, not just one, but two guys were resurrected from the dead. And I mean dead, dead, three days dead. Lazarus and this guy named Jesus. Are you open-minded open enough to believe that what 500 people experienced and documented... And then history redocumented. Are you open minded enough to believe that, as weird as it is to think about, actually happened? And that you also someday might experience the same? Are you open minded enough to believe that there can be the healing? that Paul talks about in Acts. And I love that he says, hey, it's not my piety, it's not my righteousness that gave me the ability to heal this guy. I've not, I don't have some secret religion figured out. It's a power, the same power, that's always been at work in our lives that did this. The same power you chose to ignore and crucified. And that same power has come back and he has a message for you. And you may be surprised to find out that that message is not anger, but peace. Be at peace with yourself. Be at peace with each other. And most certainly be at peace with God. When Luke tells us that he explained this opening as he as Luke tells us, his experience of being opened, his mind being opened to understand the scriptures, he's almost certainly talking about the promises that were spoken again and again through the prophets and the Psalms. There was, there was this idea that, that the, the people of Israel might be a, a promised people, not only that they might figure out the right rules to live by, 
But there was this also this other overarching theme throughout the poetry, throughout the Psalms, that when they failed to live up to those set of rules to live by, there was this mercy and forgiveness and healing. That overarching story. They just get got what they did not deserve. God chose to be known to them, not as a set of rules, but as a loving and forgiving presence, mercy. Mercy that saves. Not just a healing presence, but a presence that can lift off of you the weights which drag you down. Jesus opened Luke's mind to understand that God was not just playing a game with the people of Israel. He was giving a promise to the world through their songs and their prophecies and their poetry. God's mercy and healing for a lost and distracted world, a presence that's not contingent on getting the rules right, becoming a righteous nation or becoming a righteous family, a promise, a presence contingent on this one moment that Luke is so desperate for you to understand and know and experience. That when Jesus came back from the dead, which is unbelievable enough, he didn't Read Luke the riot act. He said, peace. That there is an overarching message that the world has been screaming out loud to you and that that message is peace. That God cares so much for this world that he would become a human being and even when we killed that messenger, The message was so important that he came back and said, peace to us again. Created a church where we hear very clearly we are forgiven and at peace with God. Now the stars might be speaking to you. I don't know. But we can be assured that the death and resurrection of a real living man named Jesus some 2,000 years ago, that there is one central message being given there. Whether we dare to put our hope in that message or not, there is a real and clear message being given through the cross to the world, and it's being given to you right now. God has promised to speak to you through his son, and what he is saying to you right now that seeks to guide your life, that seeks to be your faith and replace your faith in anything else it's this there is a God you were created and that God knows your name and he knows the weights that you've placed upon your heart and your souls the desire to be perfect and the frustration that you can't be the pain that you've caused for others that you deeply regret. God knows the weights and expectations you've placed upon yourself and he's done something about it. Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead to give peace, to forgive sin. To take the weight off your heart and mind so that you can freely and joyfully live. Peace. Peace be with you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to join in singing, Open My Eyes.
we confess our faith and we do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God, God, the Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join me in the prayers of the people. Lord, you, you know the weights that we, we carry with us. A lot of them we, we place there by mistake. Maybe it was a parent's expectations. Maybe it was a, a plan or a hope that we set up in our mind long ago that just doesn't need to be there anymore. A person we want to be, but we don't have to be. In fact, there's probably something more beautiful that you want us to see ourselves as. Lord, we, we give you those weights. What is more, we trust that as heavy as they are, we cannot lift them, but you have and are and do. Lord, there's, there's a couple of those things that have been sitting there for a while. They're deeply embedded. And Lord, we pray that you would give us a glimpse of your healing presence melting those things away. That we might only see ourselves as you see us, Lord, your beautiful children, fearfully and wonderfully made, free to enjoy your creation. Lord, we pray that you'd be with our family and friends that are in a deep season of of, of doubt or maybe just uh, sickness or loss. Lord, we pray that you would speak to them through us, and Lord, we trust that you're speaking to them in ways that we don't know. We give them to you, Lord. We trust them to you. Lord, we be with Debbie. Be her healer. Be with Carter and Caroline and Mary and Peter. Be with Ron. Be with Stacy, Stacy's family. Be with Bob and Dale, Kevin. We thank you for students making good choices. Lord, all this and more we give to you, trusting in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine on you and is gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor. And the Lord gives you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in singing our sending hymn, Lift High the Cross. Mm-hmm.